Welcome to the Empowered Wife Podcast, where it's all about fixing your relationship without your man's conscious effort so that you feel desired and taken care of and special, even if your relationship feels completely hopeless. I'm Laura Doyle, and if you're wondering what exactly an empowered wife is, Sometimes she starts out in a relationship that feels like it's falling apart, like mine was. She wants to be an adored wife, but instead she feels like she's begging for his attention or living with a roommate and co-parent, and nobody should have to live like that. I still remember what it was like when my marriage seemed hopeless, painful, lonely, and nobody should have to live like that. You deserve a playful, passionate relationship. And that's why my coaches and I have helped over 15,000 women fix their relationship without their man's conscious effort. And we can help you too. An empowered wife gets the support and tenderness she needs to stop feeling exhausted, lonely, and hopeless, and naturally attracts her man's time, attention, and affection like an irresistible magnet all while being authentic and getting what she wants. Most of us didn't have great role models with intimacy skills, so no one ever taught them to us. We just stumbled around making lots of mistakes and thinking relationships are really hard and dangerous, and we aren't even taught that relationships require certain skills, like everything else in life, like making an omelet, like driving a car. What's really magical about being an empowered wife, besides having a passionate, playful relationship where he pulls you in at the waist for a kiss just because you were passing in the hall, is that you also become more confident. You emanate dignity and you feel calm. That makes you more attractive. And that's why empowered wives are my favorite people to be around. And now there are thousands and thousands of us all over the world. We have over 10,000 members in my free Adored Wife Facebook group and over 150,000 email subscribers. And since you're listening right now, you may already be an empowered wife, or maybe you've just started your journey. Maybe you read the book, The Empowered Wife, or maybe you read The Surrendered Wife, or you're a student of my coaching programs, or maybe you're feeling like the furthest thing from an empowered wife, like you are suffering in a really tough relationship. And you can't even begin to see how you could improve it, especially if he doesn't get help. That may seem impossible to you right now. I get it. I remember when that seemed impossible to me too. And it's an awful feeling. And that's why I'm on a mission to end world divorce because I hate to see any woman struggle in her relationship just because no one ever showed her the intimacy skills or gave her the connection framework. That's why I wrote the books. That's why I created a relationship coach training school and a coaching school and the Facebook group and the Adored Wife Roadmap. And now, now we're going to be hanging out here on this weekly podcast so you can hear directly from wives who have been in struggling, broken relationships about what made their marriages shiny and amazing again. And so that I can share the worst relationship advice of the week award, of course. In today's episode, we're going to talk about how to skyrocket the passion in your relationship, especially if you're in a sexless marriage. And my guest, Kathy, has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the First for Women magazine, uh, an interview with the BBC that went viral on several continents. And she was in a sexless second marriage, stressed out over her stepchildren heading for another divorce. But she made a decision that changed her life forever and now has a dreamy marriage to the same man. And she's going to tell us exactly what she did to single-headedly turn her marriage around and make it passionate again. And then I'll be giving out the award for the worst relationship advice of the week, which this week goes out to Laura Doyle. Wait. Is this a mistake? Sadly, no. Oh, I'm I'm awarding the worst relationship advice of the week to myself. And I'll tell you about this really lousy advice, which was in my first book, which was printed in 19 languages and in 30 countries. So I have got to set the record straight. My embarrassing mea culpa coming up. First, though, let's talk about how to skyrocket the passion in your relationship. And some of you are going to wonder what the connection is between passion and what I'm about to talk about. But I promise what I'm going to share with you today is the world's best aphrodisiac for men. What's that? You say you didn't know there was an aphrodisiac for men and that it's super effective and it works fast and it's free? 
Me neither. For years. No one ever told me. Maybe no one's ever mentioned it to you either. And when someone finally did tell me, I had no idea what they were talking about. I'm going to spell it out for you while you imagine Aretha Franklin singing it. All right. R-E-S-B-C-T. Okay. That sound like Aretha? Kind of? A little bit? No? Not at all? Well, anyway, you got the idea. It's respect. Here's the thing. If you're anything like I was, you have no idea what that looks like. I thought I was being respectful, even though I was disrespectful like around 27 times a day. And hopefully you're not as bad as I was because there was a lot of eye rolling, sighing, complaining about what he did and questioning his judgment going on around here, like tons. Not to mention I was giving constructive criticism. I was making accusations, interrogations, downright rude comments. And I thought of it as being helpful or doing what the experts suggested by expressing a concern. All of it seemed really justified to me and all of it ruined my chances that he was ever going to come in for a passionate kiss. That's what I wanted. And I had no idea That was why my husband didn't show affection for me. But when I look at these pictures now, it seems pretty obvious. I mean, in the before picture where I'm disrespectful, I look like Medusa. And then the after picture where I'm respectful, I look like a gorgeous supermodel. And if you see these pictures in the show notes later, okay, I'll tell you what, neither one of them is me, but they are reasonable facsimiles of how I appear based on whether I'm showing up respectfully. You know how you want him to see you as irresistible and beautiful? He wants you to see him as smart and capable and strong in the same way. And if you don't, he won't be affectionate. When you start acting like he's smart and capable and strong, even if you don't think so, that's going to go a long way toward bringing back the makeout sessions, the snuggling, and the sex you're craving. Now let's hear from someone who's got some first-hand experience with this. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. My guest coach, Kathy Murray, has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, First for Women magazine, and in an interview with the BBC that went viral on several continents. She was in a sexless second marriage, stressed out over her stepchildren, worried that she was likely headed for another divorce. But she made a decision that changed her life forever, and not only has a dreamy marriage to that same man, today she's a master relationship coach who has helped thousands of women over the last 19 years make their broken down relationships dreamy too. Thanks for coming on episode one of the Empowered Wife podcast to tell us the secrets of how you fixed your marriage, Kathy. Oh, it's my pleasure, Laura. Thank you so, so much. Really pleasure. So I'm dying for everyone to hear the whole story because your story is tremendous. So take us back to the very beginning. What was your relationship like? How were you struggling? Well, Laura, I think I need to start with my first marriage, if I'm honest. I just, I got married young and I didn't have any skills. I just really was in love and wanted to have a family. And so I did. I got married. We had two children, but soon into that marriage, I realized I made a really big mistake. I mean, he was immature. He wasn't responsible. And here I had become responsible because I had two children and he was staying out late at night. He was drinking. He was using drugs and constantly wanting sex from me. And I just wanted nothing to do with physical intimacy. I denied him constantly. And I just really realized I had some sexual injuries I hadn't really dealt with and Oh, I just gave him an ultimatum at one point. My my youngest child was not even a year old. And I said, you either shape up or get out. Wow. Yeah, it was scary. And I thought I was going to be alone as a single mom with two kids. But really, the truth is, I wanted him to shape up. 
And I thought that ultimatum would work. (laughs) Did it work? Oh, no, it backfired. It did. It did. He ended up leaving that week. I came home from work one day and all the furniture was gone and he was gone. And I realized, oh, my goodness, he's left. What am I going to do? Wow. Yeah. And so the next day, I found out he had rented an apartment and I found out where that was. So I went to the apartment. And I knocked on the door and a woman answered, Laura. There oh. was another woman. Mm. Needless to say, I made a really big scene at that apartment complex. All of a sudden, I wanted my husband. So I went from, you loser pants, get the heck out, grow up or get out, to, oh my gosh, that's my husband. Mm. And so at that point, you wanted to make the marriage work. Mm-hmm. So what'd you do? I told her to get out that that's my husband. And I really tried to get him to talk, um, but he wouldn't. And he ended up filing for divorce. And I just didn't know how to interact with him. I didn't know how to communicate. I didn't know how to convey. Uh, I didn't have any skills. I just didn't know. I was so, so unaware of what to do. Okay. And and that that uh, I regret. I really do. But this must have been incredibly painful at the time. You have two babies. Mm-hmm. He's left you for another woman. That must have been mm-hmm. heartbreaking. It was so hard. It, I ran home to my mom's and just cried, and I didn't know what to do. And and uh, yeah, it was hard. It was scary. I didn't I just never imagined I'd be a single mom with two kids by myself. But that is what happened. Mm -hmm. And then, but then you found love again. I did. I met, I met Doug on a blind date. Some friends of ours thought, wait, we we want to hook Kathy up with uh, Doug. And so we met on a blind date and we started dating. And what's so funny is that I had told some friends that next time I fall in love, I want to meet a mature, sober man. I just like, I put it out in the universe. And so here I meet this man, he's 12 years my senior, and he was not drinking and not drugging. And I was just so happy. I was like, oh, maybe he's the one. (laughs) This is going to be so much better than your first marriage, right? Because that guy was drugging and drinking. That was the problem. He was the problem. And now you were going to have a much better relationship with with this. And so, and how did that turn out? Wow. Well, we dated for three years, and then we did get married. And soon into the marriage, things went to hell. It was Mm. just constant fighting and conflict. And uh, his kids came to live with us unexpectedly. And they created a lot of havoc in our home. And I just uh, don't know what happened. But I just know the feeling I was having was tension, conflict, constant fighting. And he wasn't attracted to me anymore. He wasn't. So what were you doing to uh, try to fix this relationship? Oh, I took him to marriage counseling and I sent his kids to counseling. And then we went as a family also. And of course, none of that worked. None of it worked. And so I gave another ultimatum. That's all I knew what to do. And I just, yeah, I just said, fine, we're in a sexless marriage. And I moved into the guest room. Wow. Okay. And so what happened? We didn't talk for days. It was really tense. And um, I was sure I was going to be filing for another divorce. You were going to file this time. Mm -hmm. I was done. Yeah. It was really painful to be rejected Um, constantly. I used to beg and plead and cry for physical affection. He really much preferred watching TV with the dog. I have pictures that I would show him and say, look, you want to just hang out with this dog? What about me as a wife? I'm your wife. Oh, it was so, I was low. It was low point in my marriage. So you were really suffering. It was too painful to stay married with that constant reminder that you were unlovable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So did you file? No, I I went to the bookstore to find a book that someone recommended and I found your book instead. And I read it that weekend. And um, for the first time, I I didn't feel alone. Mm-hmm. I felt like, oh my goodness, I'm not the only one who's struggling here. And so I I came home and I thought, I'm going to try this out. <laughs> I didn't know what to say or do, but I remembered one little phrase and I thought, I'm going to try it out. What was it? Well, I came through the door after being gone for the weekend. And remember, we were sleeping in separate bedrooms. We'd been not talking. We'd been fighting. And so I was nervous to come home. And when I walked through the door, he came right up to me and said, what do I do with the cell phone plan? And I said, whatever you think. Mm. And he said, no, 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 no. You need to tell me what to do with the cell phone plan. And I just could hear his his insistence, and I could relate, given the book I had just read, to uh, just how unsafe I had made it by being um, controlling and emasculating him all these years by not trusting that he could make any decisions. Mm. And so I said, whatever you think, I trust you to make that decision for our family. And it, Laura, it was so foreign. I'd never said such a thing. So it was just so different for me, but it was so, so different for him. He walked away scratching his head going, what happened to my wife? (laughs) (laughs) And he made that decision. And that night I decided to crawl in bed with him for the first time in six months. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, you were so nice today. And the tears just rolled down my face and I just knew I had to reach out to you and ask you to help me save my marriage. And that's exactly what you did. You did reach out to me. I did. (laughs) And we met up for coffee, actually, right? We did. (laughs) I'm like, please, please teach me, teach me. (laughs) And so, okay, so I want to go back just for a second to um, some of the pain points. So, You're saying this was so foreign for you and so foreign for him that you would say whatever you think. So, I mean, what kinds of things were going on in your marriage where it it sounds like you were making a lot of the decisions? Mm -hmm. Oh, Laura, I, I was a CFO for a private school, so I managed a whole school budget. So, therefore, I managed all of our money. I was the breadwinner. And I thought I was more capable of making those decisions. So, yep, there was a time when I bought all the Christmas presents. And I remember him looking at me one time and saying, what, I don't get to buy any Christmas presents? I said, oh, no, I bought them all already and they're all wrapped. And I I have painted the picture like I did a good favor for our family. Really, I just wanted to make sure everybody got the same amount. There were no favoritisms and he didn't spend too much. And he wasn't irresponsible. And remember another time we were going to put tile in our kitchen. And we went to the home improvement store to make that tile selection. And I just bulldozed the conversation and completely took over what we were going to buy, the quantity we were going to buy in here. He's a builder, Laura. And I just thought I was going to be in charge of how much we spent and what we decided. I just looked at his face in front of that woman. It didn't matter to me that it was like white. (laughs) I was going to get my way no matter what. Uh, Yeah. And so, and, and then you had this epiphany that maybe you had something to do with him wanting to snuggle with the dog and not so much with you. And I saw, yeah, when I read your book, The Surrendered Wife, I, I, I saw my life. In fact, I thought, oh my gosh, does this woman have a camera in my house? <laughs> <laughs> I thought you wrote the book about me. I mean, I think it's why I felt so connected to you. And I so appreciated your courage to tell the truth because here's the thing. 
I was living a lie in my public life. I was a, as I mentioned, a CFO for a private school and I was on the chamber board and active in my kids' school and no one knew what was going on at home. I really pretended quite a lot in the public eye. Yeah. That everything was fine at home. Did your friends know? A couple of close girlfriends knew, and they told me one time, one friend told me, either shut up or get a divorce. They got so tired of hearing me complain about Doug. Oof. And so that must have felt like a little bit of a slap? Definitely. So that's why I reached out to you, because I didn't know what to do. And here you had had similar story, and I thought you're going to be understanding and helpful. Yeah. And so this was, um, gosh, about 19 years ago that we first met, and yeah. and you were very clear about your desires. You, it wasn't just about saving your marriage, was mm-hmm. it? No. I knew the minute I read the part about you helping women in your living room that I wanted to help women in my living room. I just knew that if I could have that structure and that support and that accountability, that I would... Uh, be more likely to be successful than if I went it alone. Yeah. And you have been very successful uh, with your, so tell us a little bit about what your relationship is like now. Oh my gosh. I have, I have the most amazing marriage where my husband just does everything for me. He just cannot get enough of pleasing me, which was one of my spouse fulfilling prophecies, by the way, my husband always wants to please me. And so going from a sexless marriage to one where he's just looking for all the ways to lighten my load. I mean, he cooks for me, he arranges our home to be clean, he takes care of all the cars and 10 years into my surrendering journey, no, excuse me, five years into my surrendering journey, Laura, I finally relinquished control of the finances. So he's been managing all of our finances for more than a decade, and we have more of an abundant life than I ever imagined possible. Mm -hmm. And I just am so grateful that he handles everything from building new decks on our house to taking us on romantic trips. He took me to Belize one time and uh, took me to um, the Caribbean. He's taken me to... um, Puerto Vallarta and Maui and just lots and lots of romantic trips where there's just lots of lavish gifts and fun. One one year he bought me a beautiful sapphire ring and on our 25th wedding anniversary, he bought me a new wedding set. And, oh, I just, it's almost too good to stand, Laura, if I'm honest. (laughs) Wow. Wow. I mean, and this is the same, it doesn't sound like it's sexless anymore, first of all. No, 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 no. (laughs) No, it's all about pleasing me, Laura. <laughs> yeah, gotcha. I like that. I like that. And yeah. so, and then uh, in your relationship with your children and your stepchildren has been impacted too. Tell us about that. Oh, yes. Um, yeah, those two children that came made havoc when we first got married. Oh my gosh, they're my kids. They're just my kids. They've contributed to the joy in my life. And I'm so grateful for them accepting me as their mom and oh, just love those kids. They're both married and have their own kids now. And they admire me and Doug and what we have. And they got to witness, all four of our kids got to witness the transformation and see this blended family succeed. And Now they're proud and want their friends to know that marriage is something that can be possible and positive. And uh, I'm so, I'm so proud of that. Yeah. Cause you've fixed this family, not just your marriage, but your whole family. Now you uh, have become a role model for uh, like a beacon of hope. uh, Mm. What's possible. And And, it's, go ahead. (laughs) I'm sorry, Laura. I can't, I can't leave out the fact that when, when I started learning about the skills and especially the skill of respect, it just weighed, weighed heavy on my heart how disrespectful I was in my first marriage. And so as I was learning to be respectful with Doug, I realized I had an apology to make to my first husband. And mind you, he had been estranged from his children for almost a decade. So that divorce that happened in my first marriage, it caused so much conflict that my kids didn't get to see their dad for 10 years. 
And then I was learning about the skill of respect and I wrote the apology letter and it reconciled our relationship, our friendship, and my kids got their dad back. Wow. Wow. And your relationship with your ex-husband is now a respectful one. Yes. And, and that's a kind of amazing thing. So, so both of your families are healed yeah. just yeah. from you taking this single-handedly. You've healed both of those families. Mm-hmm. And now it's, not, it's gone way beyond your family. Hasn't it? Yes, yeah. I did. I, 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 I did ask you to teach me how to have that circle in my living room, and I'm so grateful that you said yes to a few of us there in 20, 2002, I think it was. And um, yeah, I've just known I, I never wanted to leave your side, and I just knew I needed other women, although it was this surprise actually to find out that connecting with other women, being vulnerable with other women, telling the truth about my struggles would increase my own practice of the skills and and deepen my fulfillment and my purpose in life. I had no idea that was going to happen. And now you are a coach's coach. You train all the coaches at Laura Doyle Connect. You lead the practicum. You're, I mean, you're powerful. You cause transformations, mm-hmm. breakthroughs, and and yeah. And how does that impact your relationship? Oh, it's just such an incredible experience to to um, practice the skills with other women. There's just no way you can be in a conversation with other women and then get off the phone and not consider your own self care, for example, or hear or see your own slip up. I still tell them how to drive, Laura, sometimes. <laughs> so in 19 years of practicing skills doesn't mean I'm perfect, right? I need this community. I want this community surrounding me. And uh, I'm so inspired by the courage and the commitment of other women and it's a reminder of where I once was and how I want to continue to get as good as it can stand, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, and when you think about that woman who was knocking on the apartment door and found the other woman and was causing mm-hmm. the scene and saying, that's my husband, after you'd made the ultimatum, mm-hmm. what would you want to say to her now? What do you know now that you'd want to say to her? Oh. <sighs> take a nap, honey. (laughs) Right. I just didn't have any self care. I didn't have any dignity. I didn't, I didn't know what being a dignified woman or wife was, or I didn't know what staying on my paper was. I didn't even know what I wanted, Laura. I only focused on what I didn't want. I had no idea what a desire was. And now it's like, I write my desires list every day because they all come true with this work, with these skills. So I would just say, um, be gentle with yourself and know there's a possibility for you to turn it all around if you really want to. And it just takes a courage and vulnerability and a commitment and if you can get a guide and these skills, a coach, you too can create all you want and more. <laughs> yeah. And this is a this is incredibly uh personal stories, difficult stories to talk mm-hmm. about. Mm-hmm. Why why are you why are you willing to talk about these stories? I think I hid out for so long and didn't tell the truth for so long that it became painful. And, you know, I was an accountant for 25 years and, and just, it just didn't serve me to hide out behind that Excel spreadsheet on my computer and your courage to tell your story inspired me, Laura. And, uh, I just thought if I could make the difference for one woman, it would be worth telling my story and coming out of hiding. And so I'm grateful for those opportunities you mentioned earlier about, the Wall Street Journal or the BBC or some blogs I've written on your website. And I just find that the women I get to talk to on the phone and connect with, the more I can uh, share that I'm just like them. 
and they find courage in my story. Uh, the the more we can make a dent in ending world divorce and and change families one at a time. Beautiful, Kathy. What's a what's a tip for a woman who's listening and she's in one of the situations you've been in, a sexless marriage or a guy who's drinking and drugging or, you know, mm-hmm. alone with those two babies. What what's your tip for her? Choose your faith over your fear. I just found that my mindset was so much part of the problem is that I just constantly looked at what was wrong what I didn't want. And there's just a whole other side of the equation that is one that propels new actions that create different results. And so the tip would be to be willing and open-minded, perhaps experiment, be willing to experiment, give it 90 days, practice the skills for 90 days and see what happens. And, And what if a woman said, well, these just aren't working. The skills are not working for me. They don't work. Yeah. You know, in my experience, I've just never seen the skills not work when they're practiced. And so for me, it's probable that there's a blind spot there. And all you need is a guide and a coach to stand for your marriage and you. I mean, what would it be like to have you, Laura Doyle, in your life? I don't know how I could have what I have today, Laura, if it wasn't for you standing by me and by my marriage for 19 years. So I just say... Get a coach. <laughs> There's nothing like having a coach standing for your marriage. And now you are that woman that stands for all these other thousands of marriages. Yes. Now. And and there's like no giving up, like not on Kathy Murray's watch. Are you uh-uh. going to have anything less uh-uh. than a, a, a shiny, vibrant, amazing relationship? And, and you sure have a lot of fans now because Aww. of your work. Uh, and, and you act and you run the entire company, right? You run all of Laura Doyle connect Mm -hmm. in addition to causing all these transformations. Mm -hmm. Um, and what I get from listening to you is that there's a a moral obligation. It's kind of beyond passion Mm -hmm. that you don't want to live in a world where women don't know, uh, don't get the information, don't get the support, don't get the help that they need to have the kind of marriage that you have today. It's so true. I I'm on a mission to get this in the school system. I, 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 it's true, Laura. Thank you so much. I, I am just honored that I get to talk to women on our campus every day and empower coaches and train coaches. It's true. And even fielding brand new women who find you because of your beautiful books or your blogs, which will now be your podcast, which I'm so excited about to reach even more women. But I'm excited for them because I can see what's going to unfold for them. And um, I just don't want another woman to suffer any longer than she needs to. And so, yes, I'm on a mission right alongside you, Laura, for the skills to get in the hands of every woman. Well, your passion is very evident. So inspiring, Kathy. Thank you so much for sharing so authentically. it's clear you're a real woman. You really do exist. You really did have these challenges, these breakdowns. um, Mm -hmm. And you really did find a solution for yourself that Mm -hmm. uh, is a beacon of hope for everyone. Oh, thank you so much, Laura. Yeah. Thank you. If you're wondering how to get started with fixing your relationship and making it shiny again, then you need a roadmap. Get six simple steps to follow that will set your relationship up for success. Discover three common mistakes that wives make trying to fix their relationship that just make things worse. When you download my free Adored Wife Roadmap, you can do that at getcherished.com. Go to getcherished.com now to get your roadmap in minutes. Talk about getting your inspiration for the day. And now it's time to give out the award for the worst relationship advice of the week. It's the worst relationship advice of the worst relationship advice. Yeah, it's the worst relationship advice of the worst relationship advice of the week. I hate hearing about anyone getting divorced, but as a relationship coach, almost every day 
I hear from a woman who is in excruciating pain and on the verge of divorce because her husband is having an affair and he refuses to end it, or his chronic excessive drinking has put her over the edge and she is afraid of what her kids are seeing, or her self-esteem is gone because of the physical abuse in their home or because he engages prostitutes. And there was a time when I would have urged these women to leave such heartbreaking situations. And I wrote exactly that in my first book, and more recently even in blogs, because I presumed I knew what a woman in such a difficult situation should do, as if I were the expert on her life. And I am not. But I've been confronted with something even worse about what I've written for all these years. And I'm embarrassed to say I was too afraid to admit it. Here is what I didn't want to admit about marriages to addicts, abusers, or adulterers. I chose my fear over my faith. When I was suffering in my marriage and thinking very seriously about ending it, I believed our challenges were insurmountable. It turns out I was completely wrong. The root of our problems was my lack of training in the six intimacy skills and not having the connection framework and the right community of like-minded women. But my husband was not physically abusive. He doesn't drink excessively. He's never been unfaithful. I have not lived through those particular hells. So those situations scared me. And instead of standing for the possibility that marriages with challenges like these could be restored, I defaulted to conventional wisdom, which says that a self-respecting woman should leave a bad man. I made one exception because of my experience, and that was with verbal and emotional abuse. I knew that that wasn't insurmountable because my husband and I, we both stopped saying terrible, hurtful, mean things to each other once I started implementing the intimacy skills and the connection framework. Then I saw lots of other marriages where verbal abuse completely cleared up when the wife practiced intimacy skills. I saw with my own eyes that verbal abuse was solvable. So whenever I heard a woman talking about that particular challenge, I brought my conviction about how how her relationship could be magical again. In other words, I chose my faith over my fear when it came to verbal abuse. And I've gotten a lot of blowback about that. You might even say I've gotten some verbal abuse about that position. Some people get angry when I suggest that verbal abuse is not always a clear-cut case of a victim and a perpetrator because both parties contribute to the melee. So I was even more afraid to propose that women married to cheating, bullying drunks could also save their marriages and their dignity with the intimacy skills. And that was terrifying to say. It still is. So here goes nothing. I've had the honor now of watching courageous women who are married to alcoholics, physical abusers, or cheaters make their marriages magical again. Every relationship has challenges. And I now see that these three particular challenges, they don't have to be deal breakers. They are daunting, but they can be resolved and tender, connected marriages can arise in their place. I wouldn't have believed it myself if I hadn't seen it. So I am definitely not the expert on your life. You are. So if you feel that your marriage challenge is unlivable, is insurmountable, I absolutely trust that you know what's best for you, which is why I never should have written that women married to alcoholics, physical abusers, or chronic cheaters should leave. That was arrogant. That was bossy of me. I regret it, and I apologize. That is the worst relationship advice of the week by far. Fortunately, lots of women ignored me on that point anyway. And if you are one of the millions of women facing any of those challenges and you want to preserve your family by making your marriage vibrant again, I'm here to offer you hope that you can do just that. I've seen it too many times to doubt it. You know, there was this woman who used a spouse fulfilling prophecy on her alcoholic husband who subsequently, and to her amazement, quit drinking as she repeated what felt like a bold-faced lie that he didn't drink much. And she called me astonished that he hadn't had a drop to drink in the two weeks since she had changed her focus. 
Another wife wrote a blog about her similar experience that's on my website on lauradoyle.com. You can look that one up. And then there was the young wife who was devastated by her husband's affair. And she said to me, people told me that I would never be able to trust him again. But I now know that's a lie. I trust him because I decided to trust him. And he's living up to the trust that I give him. Another wife explained that it wasn't until she stopped focusing on the other woman who had been in their life for years that her husband's mistress disappeared from their lives and he turned his affection and his attention back to her and her alone. Still another woman whose husband had a mistress overseas and had slept with prostitutes throughout their marriage, applied the intimacy skills and got a coach, did the best she could even as he left the country to be with the other woman. And to her surprise, he came back to her and he said, I love you, I miss you, and I'm sorry. And recently, a wife who separated from her husband because, in her view, he was both physically abusive and alcoholic, she confessed to me that she had been looking for an excuse to leave him. Her evidence was an incident where he was drunk, and she pulled out her phone to videotape him to show him later how stupid he was being. Her husband hurt her hand, arresting the phone from her so he could smash it to bits by slamming it into the wall repeatedly. So it was definitely bad behavior by any measure. But now that she is reconciled with him, she says she would use neither alcoholic nor physically abusive to describe her supportive, hardworking, thoughtful husband and father of their three children. She now feels safe. She feels connected. And he's the same guy. He still drinks but she doesn't call him an alcoholic anymore. And these are just a few of the miracles that I've witnessed. And now I know there are no good guys or bad guys. You know, that's another problem with what I wrote about husbands who are actively addicted, physically abusive, or chronically unfaithful. I said, if your husband is not one of those guys, then he's a good guy, which implies that the other three I singled out, those are the bad guys, right? And one of my coaches called me on this well, she was training with me, and I felt terrible. She explained that her husband identified as an alcoholic and had slips from time to time with his sobriety, but it didn't make him a bad guy. And I couldn't argue with that. Of course, her husband was a good guy. She wouldn't have married him otherwise. And life isn't so black and white. We're all shades of gray with good qualities and not so good qualities and just as my husband went from being a hopeless loser pants back to being the smart, handsome, funny man I'd married once I changed my perspective, I've seen that even alcoholics, abusers, and cheaters improve dramatically when their wives choose respect and gratitude over criticism and blame. Defining an alcoholic, that is tricky business. I mean, who's to say for sure that your husband qualifies, right? Carla told me she was sure her husband was an alcoholic, but he didn't think so. And it ended up being a source of conflict until he died after 45 years of marriage. And as a widow, Carla told me that she wondered if perhaps she had been too eagerly looking for a problem and then found what she was looking for. I could relate. When I was looking for a loser pants, and that's what I found too. Now, safety still comes first. If you believe you are not safe or that your children are not safe, then I support you becoming safe, whatever that looks like for you. I am not suggesting that women with husbands in these three categories should just suck it up and put up with hurtful conditions indefinitely. Not at all. I am talking about the very real possibility of these wives creating amazing, vibrant marriages, the kind that every woman dreams of nothing less. And of course, if that's your situation, you may be afraid that you will suffer trying to get to the kind of marriage every woman dreams of. And I get it. The biggest problem early in my marriage was that I was afraid. I was terrified that I would be hurt, abandoned, and treated unfairly. And I focused on that so much that I created a marriage where I felt hurt, abandoned, and treated unfairly. It just goes to show you how powerful I am at manifesting. But it's not just me. We are all creating what we focus on. And today, I'm very careful where I point my manifester. I choose what thoughts I 
dwell on and what I say out loud very carefully, picking only the ones I want to experience more of and avoiding the ones I don't want to experience. I know that it's impossible to experience anything except what I've been focusing on. When my fear arises, as it does from time to time, I question it. You know, I tear it down by gathering evidence to the contrary in the form of a gratitude list. And now I feel like I understand what Franklin D. Roosevelt meant when he said that we have nothing to fear but fear itself. Indulging my fear causes me needless emotional turmoil, or I call it NET for short, N-E-T. And so even though I feel some fear about coming out in favor of all women who want to use the six intimacy skills and the connection framework to save their marriages, including those married to alcoholics, cheaters, or physical abusers, I've decided to focus on how many have already come forward after successfully getting the relationship of their dreams. By being the first to do it, you have paved the way for thousands more to create the marriage they've always wanted with the man they chose. And if that describes you, I acknowledge you for your courage. It inspires me to see what you've accomplished. Be sure to hit the subscribe button so that you get next week's show about becoming an irresistible magnet. This week's fun fact is that I was a nerdy kid. I lettered in Scrabble. And until we talk again, take good care of you.